Hey everyone, welcome to the KE Report and a company update from District Metals, chatting with the president and CEO Garrett Ainsworth. Garrett and I are going to be recapping some recent news on some UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle surveys in Sweden around the Nyanfors and Sockjarn projects, which the company, after completing these surveys, also expanded the land positioning at these projects. And as we always do, quick update on the moratorium, uranium moratorium in Sweden, where there has been some recent news since the last time Garrett and I chatted at the end of August. District Metals is traded on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol DMX, on the OTCQB under the symbol DMXCF, and the NASDAQ First North Exchange DMXSESDB. Now, Garrett, let's first and foremost just get a bit more of a background on the Nyanfors and Sockjarn projects. We've mentioned them almost in passing in past interviews because so much of the focus is at the Viken project, which already holds the very large uranium resource. But Sockjarn and Nyanfors, give us a background on these assets, please. Yes, absolutely, Corey, and and I'm glad you survived Beaver Creek. And oh, it was that was an easy one to survive. It was bullish. <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, totally. You're totally correct. I mean, a lot of the focus with District Metals is has been all about our Vikan project. You know, it, it contains the Vikan Energy Metals deposit that has the second largest uranium resource or re resource deposit in the world or, or the largest undeveloped uranium deposit in the world. So, you know, we don't sometimes spend enough time on Sockjarn and Nineforce, which are a totally different kind of kind of uranium polymetallic target here. So these are more intrusive related where intrusive rocks have come into metasedimentary rocks and during that that process have precipitated out uranium mineralization along the along the contacts. And, uh, you know, the, the benefit of this is you get grades of uranium that are quite a bit higher. They, both projects, Sockjarn and Nineforce, have not been really tested for any rare earth elements in any kind of a serious way. There's been a few, few samples here and there that show that there are some, some good levels of rare earth elements. But with Sockjarn, it, it contains the Sockjarn uranium deposit. It's got a historical inferred resource with about 1.14 million pounds of uranium at a grade of about 680 parts per million uranium. It's it's basically deposit is open in, in all directions. It has drill intercepts, you know, from five to nine meters wide with grades of like 0.13% U308 up to like 0.18%. I mean, th these are kind of intercepts that you would find in the Colorado Plateau, but very importantly, it's also very shallow outcropping and, you know, hasn't been tested beneath 150 meters depth so and then with nine force it's actually never been drilled but there are almost a thousand uranium boulders on nine force in a prospect called Majas Bariet. so the average average grade of these uranium boulders is about 0.16 percent u308 also has some yttrium as well in it that's a rare earth element and some molybdenum but some some of the grades of uranium in these boulders actually get up to 1.4 percent u308 uranium so that's that's a really good good grade and and the geological survey of sweden back in the early 1980s put together a mineral exploration target estimate of a, you know pretty much a minimum of 13 million pounds of uranium predicted to grade between 700 to 1400 parts per million uranium and again as mentioned before these these properties have not really been explored since the 1980s 1970s and here we come along with this beautiful drone survey very high resolution and it's worked extremely well so what did you see in these surveys clearly you saw something you like because you expanded the land package so Give us an understanding of what you saw and where you expanded these land packages. Yeah, so with, with Sockjarn, uh, of course, we got some anomalies on the boundary of, of one of our mineral license licenses that compri comprises Sockjarn property. So we had to extend it out to make sure we fully contained the, the airborne uh, radiometric anomalies. And so these radiometric anomalies were indicating that they're, they're, it was sourced from uranium 
very very importantly and you know we're we're pretty interested when we see like a mag a moderate mag response or or a mag high because that could indicate the intrusive that's that's coming under and and precipitating precipitating out the uranium and then you know the radiometric part of the survey is is picking up the boulders more likely or if there's some outcrop but typically if if there's uranium mineralization outcropping that's already been you know previously discovered and and mapped out such as the sockjarn uranium deposit but i mean the the flight lines at sockjarn were 50 meter line spacing so the resolution that we have to be able to go into the field you know next year is is incredibly good to follow up on on these targets and then eventually to hopefully be drilling them as well at, at nine force i mean obviously because there's almost a thousand uranium boulders at majest badiat you know that that got picked up beautifully there but we had a nice surprise because we you know on the on the east edge of of one of the mineral licenses we we had a, a uranium spike so we we extended the survey further to the east and lo and behold we found a whole new area located about 1.9 kilometers to the northeast of Majas Badiat which is you know even larger in in size but is a radiometric anomaly associated with with uranium so it's a very exciting outcome to to kind of have that to show up in the survey and and yeah we've got a lot a lot of field work already kind of starting to pile up on on the books for uh, for next year so do we need to wait for next year? Is there anything you can do in the meantime? Or if we are waiting to, for next year, when can you get back on the ground here and start further exploring? Yeah, ideally we wait. Obviously, there's a, a uranium moratorium in Sweden right now, and we can we can talk about that the status of that exactly later. But ideally we wait for the uranium moratorium to be lifted, which looks like it could could happen hopefully for, you know, to get voted on in the fourth quarter of this year and then and then the legislation changes on on January 1st 2026 and then and then the plan yeah would be to go out kind of ground truth some of the airborne radiometric and magnetic data that we have and basically get it get it up to a drill ready stage i mean it's in some cases it's it's already drill ready that's drilling is definitely something we wouldn't want to do until we get full confirmation from from the, the Swedish government that they've lifted the uranium moratorium. So Garrett, what's the strategy here? You, you hold the Viken project that to my understanding, still very much the focus, but these two other projects, now that you just expanded the land package, you liked what you saw in these surveys. Do you explore them all yourselves or are you working these up to potentially bring in a partner? I think initially, I mean, we've already started to explore all of them by our, on ourselves. But yeah, I think as we kind of progress and, you know, a lot of focus is going to be shifting towards our Viken property. So I think we're definitely open to, you know, potentially optioning out some of our other uranium polymetallic properties in Sweden that are that are non-core. And I think after the uranium moratorium hopefully gets lifted in in Sweden I think you'll see a lot more you know players come in to explore and, and develop uranium properties in Sweden because it, it is a fantastic country to to be operating in I mean it's it's ranked very highly by the Fraser Institute and there's just so much ground to to look at and you know go back to historical work that was done and, and follow up on but you know there really has not been any significant work for on most of these uranium districts in Sweden for about 40 years or so. So how can you balance out all this work? You only have such a big team. And yes, I know we're still waiting for really the conclusion of this moratorium, but how are you going to be able to balance out moving really your portfolio of uranium or energy metals projects forward? Well, I mean, we we've already got a pretty pretty good sized team, you know, from the technical side, you know, myself, Hein Rat, our VP exploration. We we have three three geologists also that work, you know, either consulting or or on a full time basis for us. I think it's it's just you know the amount of work that we do it will uh, kind of reflect on what size the team grows to. With the Viken project, we'll we'll be you know, looking to hire someone like that could be a, a VP development role, which makes a lot of sense for, for, 
someone to be fully concentrating on economic study for, for the Vikan deposit. And yeah, I mean, right now, well, we have five uranium projects and they're quite manageable, but we'll, we'll be adding more help, I think, in, in the new year. Are there other opportunities in Sweden to further acquire and build your portfolio of energy metal projects? Absolutely. Yeah, there's, yeah, again, it, it all comes down to, you know, no, no one's really given a, a really hard look at the uranium potential from more of a grassroots perspective in, in Sweden. And, and that's what we've been doing. And that's what's resulted in the generation of, of, you know, our very exciting projects, you know, especially outside of the Viken property, because obviously the Viken property is well known as, as because it's such a large mineral resource estimate. But yeah, that's the, that's really the path forward here is to, you know, work on our existing projects, but we're also looking at other, you know, opportunities that are earlier stage as well. All right, let's just quickly circle around to that moratorium, though, and also the crazy volatility that the district metal stock saw right around that meeting and announcement. Stock went up, stock went kind of back down, and then has continued its uptrend afterwards. But talk to us about the moratorium. You've already given some insights on that, but really just a summary. And then what's going on with the stock here? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah, where we're at with the moratorium is on August 27th. There was a press briefing by the Swedish Ministry of Environment, just basically laying out what's going to be happening with 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 the government's intention to lift the uranium ban on mining. And then the following day, she submitted the proposal or the bill to Parliament, and that was received. They're having meetings, discussions regarding this uranium lift bill. That's going to they're ongoing probably this week actually. And then I believe there's a special committee that's coming together in mid-October to have further discussions. And I believe they'll, they might make a recommendation as to, you know, approve the bill, which is, which is likely expected. And not entirely sure when the vote, the formal vote on this bill will happen. I mean, it could be mid-November, it could be early December. But yeah, the, the key thing is that all this happens before January 1st. The government's you know, stated that their intention is to approve the, the, the bill before the end of the year so that it, the legislation can change on January 1st of 2026. And as far as like the trading goes, yeah, I'll say that District Metals is, is kind of a, a beast in its own right. It, it trades you know, quite often when some of the other uranium companies are, are down, district will be up and vice versa. And I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, the news that, that comes out of Sweden. So any any time you see news in, in the media regarding uranium or nuclear, that, that can, you know, affect district's share price. And any time that you have, you know, a government party that's negative on the uranium moratorium or positive, then that, that has an effect to its own on district share price as well. So it's, I think there's a lot of people watching this story, which is really good. And, uh, you know, my, my main goal is to make sure to maximize the number of people that know about this district metal story so that, you know, when the, hopefully the actual lift occurs, then we, we maximize share price appreciation. All right. Well, Garrett, I'll keep following up with you as more news comes out and any more questions come in. I did get a lot of questions around the moratorium news and that share price volatility. Now we had the additional news where you're building land positions around a couple of your other assets. Again, Garrett Ainsworth, president and CEO of District Metals. Please, everyone, send me any further questions you have for Garrett. I will also post a link to the District Metals website in the show notes so you can read over those recent news releases. Garrett, as always, thanks for the update. Thank you, Corey. Always a pleasure.